Welcome to the Clears Talk, Law for Sustainable Cities, a monthly podcast that focuses on all things cities, law, and environmental sustainability. In this podcast, we venture into different urban and environmental legal themes, feature special guests, and also host our own Clears researchers. For those who may not know, Clears is a research chair under the National Research Foundation's Research Chair Initiative and operates under the Faculty of Law of the Northwest University, South Africa. My name is Enrique Sanders. I am an LM student at CLES and your host for this session. Today we have Mr. Andrew Gilder with us in the CLES studio. Andrew is based at the Climate Legal and is a CLES Fellow. Our topic for today focuses on climate change law and South African cities. Welcome to CLES Talk, Andrew. We're so happy to have you with us in the studio today. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so to begin our conversation, I'd just like to ask you if you could give our audience an idea of your career progression and what piqued your interest in climate change law. So I guess I have a, an unusual career progression. So I came out of school in 1984. So that's the middle of the heart of darkness in this country. I didn't want to be a lawyer. I just wanted to stay out of the army. The option available to me to defer conscription mm. was to do an LLB as a postgraduate degree. So it literally was the option that I could study that kept me out of the army. You must understand, I had pretty blonde hair at the time and I looked really awful and khaki and camouflage, <laughs> so there was just no way that I was gonna go to the army. Um, by the end of the 80s, the political situation is changing fundamentally and I then complete the law degree, but I don't go into law, I do what I wanted to do all along, which was work in the theater. So I then spend the next 10 years variously working in the theatre, living in Turkey, being a journalist. And by the age of 31, I thought to myself, perhaps I better get a real job. And I went, well, you've got a law degree, so why don't you do a master's? I thought, well, then let's do an environmental master's because it felt like the thing to do that had some sort of meaning to it. Um, and so I did an M in uh, environmental and marine law um, at UCT, did articles in an insolvency practice, and then got an opportunity to join a very small environmental legal consultancy in Johannesburg, which I did. The very first piece of work I got to do was to advise on the law around environmental impact assessment for a climate mitigation project and the rest is history. So I didn't choose climate change law, it's chose me. Mm, I mean, yeah. really, really, I do this area of law because of a mistake of history. If I had started um, becoming a lawyer in 1990, I would never have done this because it didn't exist then. I think it's quite, it's quite obvious to say that you've had an interesting journey into the legal profession and it's quite fun to listen to. Just, I wouldn't recommend this, <laughs> this career progression for anyone else, but it is at least a career progression. It works progression. for you. It works for <laughs> so what is your current role at Climate, Le at Climate Legal? Climate Legal is a two-person specialist climate change, carbon markets, climate finance, carbon finance and environmental legal consultancy. So we do all of the things that you would recognize that um, an environmental lawyer would do mm -hmm. but and more more so we we work in the climate change and carbon space so, I mean as an example um, the first piece of work we did and when I say we uh, my uh, co-director is Olivia Rumble my colleague who lives in Cape Town um, the first piece of work we did as climate legal was draft the South African climate change bill which is currently before parliament and so I do Everything. The, the difference between working in your own small consultancy is that in your own small consultancy, nothing gets done unless you do it. If you work in a big corporate law firm, you know, roles are differentiated. Mm -hmm. I like not having the roles differentiated. It allows for kind of interest and flexibility. You were involved in the drafting of the much-awaited climate change bill prior to its initial publication in 2018. What was your experience and expectations of this process? So, I mean, I, that's a good... I, I, I don't think we had expectations, uh, although perhaps our expectations were more pronounced than what, what the bill looks like. Let, let me be clear. We, we went into that 
that piece of work um, perhaps overly energetic, mm. not understanding that there's a political dimension to what you are doing when you're drafting legislation. And you can see the political dimension in the bill as it currently exists. So um, that political dimension is reflected in the fact that it's a SEMA, so it's a, a Specific Environmental Management Act under NEMA, under the National Environmental Management Act, which means that it's framework legislation. You can't look at that bill and go, ah, I am the owner of a factory, here are my obligations around climate change, because it anticipates mm. that there will be further regulation and elaboration of the law um, um, under the bill. The, the experience was really very interesting. I personally had never worked before that, that um, assignment. I had never worked, well, let me put it this way, I had only ever worked on the side of the private sector. Mm -hmm. So I'd only been in a position where government was either the regulator that I needed to try and collaborate with and cooperate with because my client needed something with them, or they were the regulator to whom I would snipe. So I would write appeals and snotty letters and complaints. The difference this time was that I was government. And I never appreciated the level to which government sits in the middle of um, a storm of controversy, particularly in this instance where there is effort and energy being put into opposing what you're doing by both civil society, three times, civil society, labor, and industry. So it doesn't matter what you're doing, nobody likes it. Um, so it was a fascinating experience from that perspective. I'd never been in the middle, in the eye of that storm. I'd always been part of the storm. Well, I can imagine. Um, and could you reflect on how a climate change act might enable cities to engage in climate action in South Africa? And how does this relate to the role of non-party stakeholders under the international climate change legal regime? Sure. So, so non, the idea of non-party stakeholders is, a, is an idea that was formed. It's been around for a long time in the international space, but it was formally introduced into um, the climate change regime under the Paris Agreement. So there is particular space made for the role of non-party stakeholders under Paris and cities are part of non-party stakeholders. So let's be clear, a party with a capital P under the regime is the state. So the South African national government. Mm, yeah. Cities are non-party stakeholders in the same way that NGOs are uh, civil society organizations and the like. The, 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 the Climate Change Act, when it becomes an act, provides quite specifically for work that needs to be done at the city level, at the municipal level, for municipalities to characterize what that municipality or that city needs to do in order to respond to climate change and then how to do it. So the, the Act, frankly, is fundamental to activating the single most important part of government for the climate change response and that single most important part of government for the climate change response is cities. It's, it's going to be, we are going to respond to climate at the municipal level or not at all. Mm. Okay, so bearing this all in mind, what are your expectations for South African cities to contribute to climate resilience based on the current climate change legislative framework? Do you believe cities could set out achievable goals to work towards? So cities have to set out achievable goals to work with. Um, the, we are going to feel uh, the impacts of climate change at the city level, simply mm. because we, it will be felt by people and people's um, most... The, the proximity of government to people is the municipality. So, so municipalities have to deal with the, the practical impacts of climate change. I mean, you know, kind of a simple example might be if you're a, um, a coastal municipality, you are going to find that your options for the establishment of new mm. um, townships in close proximity to the coast are going to be limited. You're going to have to change where you put you know, your, 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 your future uh, communities. You're going to have to take account of the changing geophysical environment in how you plan your city and how you plan the expansion of your city. The, if we are going to be resilient to climate change. 
it is going to start at a city level. Yes, it's going to be guided perhaps at the national and provincial level. And we're going to talk about resilience as a national project, but actually the implementation mm -hmm. of resilience, the, the implementation of resilient activities is going to be at city level. Mm, okay. Do you think the current legislative framework creates an enabling environment for cities to contribute to the sustainable development goals, particularly goal 11 and 13? Yes, but only to the extent that we don't know what that, what that um, will look like at the moment, as I've said. I mean, if, 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 if that enabling environment, if that legislative framework is for want of, of something else to reach out to the climate change bill, yes, we can say it does, but we don't know how yet. Because the way the bill works, the way the act will work is to assume, is to require cities themselves to take action, to determine what they need and to take those mm -hmm. actions. So it's facilitative in the sense that it's, it's an option for cities um, to, to take action. We don't know what those actions will be. Mm -hmm. Yes, I understand what you mean. And so in your experience, what are some of the most important areas where climate change research in law at postgraduate level is still required? So all areas, it's all over. <laughs> it's so new. I mean, I, I, I have for years, I have spent 20 years telling, to be, telling people I'm a climate change lawyer. There are still colleagues in, in, in this space who deny the fact that climate change law exists. So let me link that back to environmental law. In mm. 1989, very well-known jurist, Professor Cowan, now the late Professor Cowan, wrote um, an article in which he was, it's seminal, it's um, undergraduate reading in, in the environmental legal context. And he argued in that article that environmental law doesn't exist, that it was just some sort of flavor of administrative law. Now, in 1989, you might have been able to make that argument. You probably couldn't make that argument now for various reasons, including the great um, evolution of environmental legislation in this country. Mm. So we can say, well, we have an environmental legal framework uh, and, and a regime in this country. And in fact, many of the colleagues who say to me that climate change law doesn't exist will claim that they are environmental lawyers. Um, mm. I, I think climate change law exists. I think it's, 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 it's a hybrid discipline that takes, takes a range of ideas into account, including some of the things that, that environmental law tends either to ignore or, or to touch only peripherally. For example, um, the financial consequences of, of environmental, of climate impact. So you can't really identify a single sector of governance that will not have to take climate change into account. So consequently, climate change is an important issue that government and governance needs to take, mm. to take on board. Mm. I think that's a very interesting point that you've made. And I'd also like to ask you, where do you think South Africa and its cities are behind on integrating the climate change agenda into law? Um, for example, are there areas where we're ahead from a developing country perspective? So we're ahead, um, or at least on par with certain other developing countries in that we have a, 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 a nascent statute. There are other mm -hmm. developing countries, including African countries, that actually already have climate change legislation. Kenya's one, Uganda's the other, Nigeria's another. The South African statute is, is kind of unique. So unique means singular. I don't know if it's entirely singular. It is unusual in that it provides both for mitigation and adaptation. Most climate statutes, whether they are draft or in operation in the country, focus virtually exclusively on mitigation. Mm. The requirement for adaptation in, in the South African bill was very deliberate on, on the part of the clients, the client being national government, okay? And you can trace that origin back to the 2011 White Paper, which specifically encompassed mitigation and adaptation. So we've, we are legislating for adaptation. That's like legislating for how to herd cats, to be quite honest with you. <laughs> you have no idea how that's going to turn out, but we've done it nonetheless. But isn't that always fun? Of course. <laughs> Bring it on. It will be exciting to watch. <laughs> um, and then on a different topic, I think, 
Um, as I understand it, a lot of your experience pertains to carbon pricing. Can you give our audience an idea of where cities fit in fit into entities liable for carbon tax, especially with reference to the post-2020 mitigation commitments? So we, we can spend hours unpacking that, but let, let, let's, let's limit it to the following. So in 2019, Treasury promulgated a carbon tax act. And the way the Carbon Tax Act works actually is very similar to a lot of um, environmental legislation in this country. So you are tax liable if you conduct a particular activity. So there's an analogy there with um, environmental impact assessment. Mm -hmm. For example, if you conduct a listed activity, you are required to get um, an environmental authorization. So if you conduct a taxable activity, you are tax liable. That means that at the level of the taxable activity, cities themselves would only be liable if they conduct a taxable activity. And they do. They conduct waste management activities, for example. Um, In the first phase of the carbon tax, the one that we are currently in and which has actually the finance minister extended that first phase now until the end of 2025. It was supposed to come to an end at the end of this year, 2022. In that first phase, those activities, those taxable activities that municipalities conduct most specifically like waste management actually are completely exempt from carbon tax. So at the, at the moment, municipalities typically are not paying carbon tax. By the way, this is slightly different from the way municipalities interact with the rest of the, of the tax regime. So municipalities don't pay income tax, they don't pay VAT. Um, they might pay VAT, I don't know. I'm not a tax <laughs> the, 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 the kind of tax consequences that we usually associate, associate with kind of um, incorporated or larger entities don't usually apply to municipalities. Carbon tax is different. They will pay carbon tax. What's important about the Carbon Tax Act is that it introduces a domestic carbon price signal in this country. So that means that we have a carbon price in South Africa, and it is the base rate of the carbon tax in a particular year. Mm. So um, staying on the conversation of carbon tax, I'd like to ask, in your view, could carbon tax be used to mobilize initiatives to make cities more carbon neutral, particularly coming from a national treasury who is involved in the city support program? So it could, but there would need to be a, I think, fundamental philosophical shift within treasury. At the moment, treasury's view, and it's expressed in Section 2 of, of the Carbon Tax Act, So Section 2 of the Act says something along the lines of there shall be levied for the National Fiscal Fund, that's possibly the incorrect term, a tax named the carbon tax. So at the moment, Treasury says we are imposing a carbon tax on you, we are taking that carbon tax revenue and we are putting it into the National Fiscus. We will, as Treasury, decide what to do with Mm. it. That's different from a scenario where Treasury is saying we will take carbon tax revenue and we will ring fence it and apply it to specific, let's say, um, climate change friendly purposes like supporting renewable energy uptake. Mm. So the answer to your question is yes, possibly, but it would need Treasury to acknowledge or to agree to apply carbon tax revenue to Um, supporting uh, carbon neutral activities within cities. Mm. I think that was a very elegant answer. Oh, why, thank you. No problem. Um, Currently, there is a major focus globally on climate change litigation. Could you share any noteworthy cases that are, to your mind, relevant for urban areas in the global south? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to say about this, but let's, I'm mindful of time, so let's let's take a South African case, which is really, really important. So the the Tabometsi matter, Mm. Um, I, and I mean, Tomoetsi is really interesting for various reasons, but I mean, it's, it's interesting because it is a, an environmental matter made on the basis of non-compliance with administrative law, but it has climate change consequences. Mm. And, and so effectively what happened at Tomoetsi was that a coal-fired power station um, was granted an environmental authorization and civil society appealed, I think, the end coal campaign campaign 
or life after coal, sorry, um, supported by the Center for Environmental Rights. Colleague Nicole Loser, um, who's the senior lawyer in climate change at the CER, driving that matter, challenged the authorization on the basis that climate change considerations had not been taken sufficiently into account in the specialist studies that underpinned the EA. And the courts agreed. Um, and, and uh, you know, the, the, there were... Um, the authorization was withdrawn and there were various processes. I think that matter still might be ongoing now. But, but the point is, and this goes to your question about relevant for, for the, the global south, absolutely. Mm. We now see as a matter of course that environmental assessment processes require climate change impact assessment. Mm. So there's nothing in the law, it, it may have been amended uh, uh, by now, there might be climate change might be a requirement within the list of considerations underpinning an uh, environmental impact assessment. But let me tell you, I regularly get calls twice a month going, "Hi, we've got a client that needs a climate change impact assessment. Can you help?" And the answer is no, because I'm not a scientist, mm. but I can pass them on to people that can do that. Mm. I think. I especially think that that case is a very good example, um, and it's also a very interesting one. So for our last question for our session today, I'd just like to ask, what do you deem City's biggest challenges, both in terms of adaption and mitigation? How do you think the laws can still respond to this, if at all? So, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky question in that the answer is it will depend on the nature of a city and the nature of the geophysical impact. That, that a city uh, might experience. So if we've got, let's take adaptation, let's take a coastal city versus an inland city. The challenges facing a coastal city are going to be things like coastal inundation. I mean, I'm not a fan of the notion of sea level rise because that assumes that while we stand there, you know, our socks will start getting wet. It's not about that. <laughs> it's, it's about the idea that as we move on, the, the more extreme events, so um, high tides and flooding events are, are going to become more pronounced and more prevalent, which means that the way that city adapts to that climate impact is going to be different from how an inland city mm. might adapt. So a coastal city might need to build barriers like the Thames, the, the, the Thames barrier, for example. An inland city might need to take account of the fact that there are going to be increasingly fewer water resources that um, the city can call upon to expand. The law has to underpin what cities do in future, but what's interesting for me is that it's not necessarily going to be something that we name climate change law. On the contrary, it might be a climate aspect or a climate sensitive element of an existing law like spatial planning law that will have to take into account climate change impact on considerations in a way that was never intended when that law was drafted. Mm. So the question, I guess, is to what extent can law accommodate an evolving and changing geophysical environment and does that law need to be amended? I think, I think that especially is a very interesting take that you have on the topic. And I would just like to say thank you very much, Andrew, thank for you, joining Andrew. Us, us for today and for the interesting discussion on um, climate change law. Uh, I found this, this session very interesting and informative. To our audience, remember to like, follow, share and subscribe and also to interact with us and our guests on social media. You can continue the conversation with us and our guests on Twitter at Chair Clares or Facebook Saatchi Clares as well as LinkedIn at Saatchi Clares. Thank you for listening to Clares Talk, Law for Sustainable Cities and look out for our next podcast.